I have a baby girl who hasn't yet started speaking. And I'm saying to myself, when she says, Abba, that's it. <laughs> like, that's going to be the day when I'm going to say, Hashem, okay, uh, thank you. But now, can you please, like, choose someone else to go through? I just, the, that's it. Like, I can't anymore. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. This week's episode, I speak to perhaps one of the strongest people I've ever met, Hadass Lowenstern. She was married to Alicia. Alicia, unfortunately, was killed in Gaza this past Hanukkah. And in this episode, I talked to Hadass about who, who was Alicia, how is she dealing with losing him, and what's her message for everyone. She is... She's very inspirational, not to sound cliche, but um, she's, you know, I, I think so many people are, are looking to her for chizik, and I think she's giving all of us so much strength. First Just off, Hadas, thank you so much for taking your time to do this. I'm sure you're extremely busy, so thank you. And I want to talk about your past month, but I, I want you to tell us about yourself from before, kind of where you grew up, and how did you end up with Alicia. Okay, so I was born in Israel. I'm ninth generation in Israel. I, w I never went uh, to Chutz Laaretz, never in my life, until I, I married an American. And I grew up in a non-religious non family, a secular family. And I had a wonderful childhood. I was very activist in many things that I thought would would make an influence on the world, politics and human rights, etc. And then at a certain point, when at a certain point I was like 24 year, years old, I was in the army. I I I am a captain. My degree is a captain in the army. I met this guy, this soldier who was with me. He was very religious. And we, we got into a fight. <laughs> we got into a, a, a big fight. I thought that he was the, the world that needs to, I thought that he belonged to the past, that he was the Jew that, that we don't need anymore. Like the, the Jewish religious with the payas and the kippah and all the davening and all the, the, I don't even know how to call it, like all the, uh, the costume, okay? He had the religious costume on him. And I thought to myself that like Jews shouldn't look like this. I mean, Jews can just be normal, regular people who talk the same way, who look the same way as everybody else. And this is what I thought. And then because we had a lot of time to talk, I started to ask myself serious questions I never asked before. I was 24 years old and I never asked myself, what does it mean that I am a Jew? What does that mean? What, what, are, my, what are my values as a Jew, not as a person? Why, why do we have so many enemies? Why do they hate us so much? Why is anti-Semitism, why, why does it exist in Israel? I mean, I understand why it exists when we were in Poland, in Russia, because we, we didn't have a country, but now here in Israel, we have a country. We're like, we're minding our own business. We're not doing ha harm. We're just doing so much good and, and still everybody hates us. Why, why do they hate us? And I started to ask myself, all kinds of questions and and to be honest i i got really good answers i i didn't expect i was sure that this man this this i don't know how to say it like this man of the past what can he what can he say to me he was old school and i was the new world and i thought that he mm -hmm. was probably just unaware of the fact that you can you don't have to be like a religious jew with your kippah and your tzitziot and not go on in your car on shabbat like you can turn on the light nothing's gonna happen in the world if you turn on the light on shabbat nothing's gonna like i did it a million times nothing happened so why why do you do this strange stuff 
And when, when I started asking myself these serious questions about who am I and why, why do I live in Israel and why do our enemies hate us so much and what is so unique about, about our Israel, why are we different from all the other nations? When I started asking myself these questions, I got really good answers. So I had no choice. I had to, I had to join. And that's how I became religious. And, and then I, I understood that if I want to be like a serious person, not just a, like today he's into Buddhism and tomorrow he's into human rights and the next day he's into, but he doesn't really, he doesn't really learn. He doesn't really, he doesn't really live according to the values that he, that he saw on a newspaper that it's really cool to be, I don't know, pro-Palestine. He, he had never even been here or, or he doesn't understand the, the, the situation at all, but he goes on rallies and says, from the river to the sea. And I'm like, yo, man, you're, you, you have no idea what you're talking about. So I wanted to be a serious person and I wanted to be a serious Jew. And I understood that in order to be a serious Jew, you have to go learn Torah, right? If you want to be a lawyer, you go, you go to law school. And if you want to be a doctor, you go to medical school. Where do you go if you want to be a serious Jew? You go to the Bet Midrash, right? You go to study Torah. So I left the army. I was more than six years in the IDF. I said, okay, guys, listen, I'm, I, I, I think I want to be a serious Jew. So I'm just going to leave this wonderful place and I'm going to study Torah. Okay. Don't, don't kill me. <laughs> and it was very hard for my friends and my family. They all th thought I lost my mind naturally. And I went to study Torah. And for three years, I sat in a, in a women's Bet Midrash here in Israel and I studied Torah. Rashi, Parashat Shavua, Halachot. I, stu I studied everything. I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I didn't even know how to... Seriously, I, di I did not know the bracha for bench lighting. Nothing. And I learned. And ever since, I, I haven't stopped learning. And really, I feel that everything I went through in my life is kind of kind of prepared me for this moment, even though you can't really, you can't really, let's say that it wasn't on my, on my list of things I want to accomplish by the time I'm 40, like being a widow was definitely not on the list, but it was on Hashem's list. And I, I am very grateful that I spent all this time learning and working on my mental health and my mental, like working on my, my perspective in life, which, which is very, very helpful right now. And you want me to tell you how I met Alicia, right? Please. So we got married, we, we met on a shiduch, like there was a matchmaker. She didn't know me personally. She didn't know him personally, but somehow she she thought it would be a good idea and we went on a date and i i i didn't understand he was so quiet and so shy he almost didn't speak i spoke the entire date and then i went back home and i said okay who did i i just i was on a date with <laughs> myself <laughs> there was a person there who listened but like who is this guy why why maybe he has nothing to say <laughs> This is what I thought. He won't speak. Maybe he has nothing to say, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And I said, okay, let's go on another date. And I think sometime, maybe the fourth, maybe the fourth or fifth date, I understood that he's not talking, not because he doesn't have anything to say. He has a lot to say. He is just not he is just a, a very righteous man, for real. And he wants to listen. It's not as dachuf for him to talk. It's more dachuf for him to listen to me. And that's, that's, that was a moment I said to myself, 
okay, that could be, that could be someone I want to live my life with. Someone who listens. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. And, and then I just, I, I fell in love. It's kind, of, it's kind of funny to say because we got engaged two months later. I, I hardly knew him. We were Shomer Negia. I, 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 I didn't really know him. But I saw in his midot, I saw how, how good person, how good of a person he is. And he really was. He was a great person. He was a great husband. He was a great father. He was a great brother. He was just really an awesome person. <laughs> I want to talk about Alicia more, but I, I, I want to focus in on the different aspects of him that I saw from the the video that, that came out a few, you know, like last week or two weeks ago that I think everyone saw um, about you talking about the fact that he was um, a Talmud Chacham and that he helped uh, translate the Gemara. Could you tell us about some of his hobbies or the things he was passionate about? He was passionate about the Torah. He was, his, he was passionate about learning Torah. That I can tell you. His last photo, which was, sh he, they took his photo like a couple of hours before he got killed. And you can see him studying Rambam. Everybody saw this picture. But when my mother-in-law saw the pictures, she said, oh my God, I can't believe it. And I said, what can you believe? Alicia learning Rambam. It's like... That's what he does. Alicia is learning. If you, you see my husband, you see him with a, with a book studying. She said, no, he has his shoes on. And I told him that he has to take off his shoes because I, I, I don't recommend anybody trying. But if you stay with your shoes for like four days, five days a week, then it begins to be... A ha it's a hazard, okay, for your feet. And she's a mother, and she told him, listen, the minute you get off the <laughs> yeah. tank, because in, inside the <laughs> tank, you understand they are fully equipped, they can't, they can't do anything, they can't take off their shoes, and they, they can't even go to the bathroom. But when you, when you are out of the tank, please take off your shoes. And she said, I can't believe it, he did not even take off his shoes. How much time does it, does it take a person to take off his shoes? A minute? Two minutes? My husband just wanted to learn. So he immediately opened his book and started learning Torah. He did not even take off his shoes. And this is the picture that everybody saw. But I, I have inside my heart a gazillion pictures of my husband learning Torah in all kinds of strange situations when I was in labor, okay? And he tells me, do you think I have enough time to study my daily, my daf yomi? Do you, do, you think I'll, do you think I have half an hour? And I'm like, yeah, I think you do. So I have a million pictures of my <laughs> husband on Shabbatot, Chagim, weekdays, at night when he comes home from work, tired, when we come home from a very happy uh, wedding or whatever, an occasion in the family, and everybody is so tired and just want to, to drop into bed. And my husband says, wait, I, I want to learn. I have to learn. I haven't daven. When, when is there a minion? And he didn't just die as a hero. Do you understand what I'm saying? My husband lived as a hero. My husband was the true hero. My, my husband was a true hero. Something that you, you mentioned also is that he helped uh, secular bar mitzvah boys learn the Parsha. Why, why is that something that you think he got involved in? First of all, I come from a secular family. And second of all, I think he felt like he's just returned to them what's theirs. That was his feeling, like, it's not my Torah. Here, let me show you, you innocent secular boy who knows nothing. He was more in a, listen, this is yours. Do you want to see it? I can show it to you. I can help you. But, but really, it's yours. 
And he put in a, a lot of time and effort to try to, to talk in a language that would be understood and to, to make connections. I can tell you that every family that he trained, we invited for a meal in our house. And we told them, we, we really want to get to know you. We really want to be your friends. We don't just, he didn't just want to, to be their tutor. He wanted to be their friend. And it came across, it came across. How have you been doing since, since the seventh night of Hanukkah? I, I, I can't even imagine how difficult it's been but you, to, to me, to the world, you, you're giving off this strength that, that w I think me and people are looking at you and like, where are you getting the strength from? So like, how, how are you actually going through what you're going through? First of all, it's not the seventh night of Hanukkah that my, my heart was broken. My heart was broken on Simchas Torah. That, that's, that's where I start my counting because what we went through here with all the, you know what happened here, right? In Israel, you know what happened. The bad guys, the bad guys did very bad stuff to our babies. And the countdown starts from there and in Simchat Torah, I just, I, we, we both understood that this is a war. This is like, we are fighting on our lives. And war has a price. I understood, I understood the, the consequences that might be to sending my husband into, into Gaza. I understood the consequences. And we spoke about it. So for me, it's not, it, it hasn't started the seventh night of Hanukkah. And actually, it hasn't started Simchat Torah. It started the minute I was born because we have, we have, we have a problem with our neighbors here. <laughs> we have, a, we, our neighbors, they don't, they don't want us here. So it started, I, I've known this my whole life, wars and terror attacks. And actually, it hasn't even started when I was born. It started, when, when Hashem gave us the Torah, right? The Torah was given on Mount Sinai, and it says in the Gemara, Sinai ardalu mot haolam. They hate us. I just learned it in this week's Parsha. They hate us. It's not something personal. It's not that they went... My husband wasn't like a drug dealer who someone was looking for him, and he knocked on our door and said, Alicia Lowenstern? Yes. That's not the story. My husband did not, he wasn't killed as, as a private person. My husband was killed because he is a Jew. The same way my great grandfather was killed, was murdered in the Holocaust. And the same way my great, 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 great grandfather was killed. This is, this is not a private, this is not a private thing. Now you ask me, where do I, Adas Lowenstern, get my strength? I get my strength from Am Israel. I don't live a prati life. This is not the language I, I, this is not the language we talk in our house. We, we never say, how, how will it be for us? We ask ourselves, how will it be for Am Israel? How will it be for Eretz Israel? How will it be for the Jews around the world looking at us? If, if, I will, if I will collapse, if I will collapse, then they win. And there's no way, can I say there's no way in hell? Because it's like, it's not a, an appropriate message. Sure, yeah. But no, you could say it, don't worry. There's no way in hell they are winning me. So I, I am using this platform. Hello, hello, Orson Israel, all our enemies around the world. Not going to work. You're not going to win us. You, you want, you, you killed our babies. We're going to give birth to millions of babies. You're going to get so many babies. Just, just see nine months from now, you're going to get so many Jewish babies. And you're not going to believe it. You wanted to humiliate our women. 
you're going to get an army of Jewish women wearing their shidles and their tichels and, and lighting candles like in front of your eyes. You're messing with the wrong nation and you should learn from history. It's not going to work. Like people have tried it before and failed. Don't, don't, just don't mess with us. Uh, this, is the, this is the language we speak in our house. So, of course, it's hard. My, my husband, my friend, my, my, the love of my life. Of course, it's hard. I have six kids. I, I have bills to pay. I have sandwiches to make. I have, I, I have many, my, I have much on my plate. Like, it's not easy. It's not easy. But Baruch Hashem, I have, I have a family. I have my kids. I have my parents. I have my in-laws. I have Alicia's brothers and sister. I have friends. I have the community. I have my neighbors. And I have Am Israel knocking on my door day and night. Like, really, I have Am Israel knocking on my door day and night helping me out. So I focus on, I focus on that and not on the, not, not on the, the pain and the loss. There will be time for this. I, I am not, I cry a lot. You see, I just, I cried in front of you. I cry a lot, but Crying doesn't mean that I am breaking down. I am crying and then I'm wiping off my tears and I'm getting up and I'm putting a load of laundry because I have six kids and that's what I do in life. Actually, I do laundry and I do laundry and I cry some more and then I call a friend and she comes with a, with a box of chocolates and then, and then like life continues. During this difficult time, you know, you are the rock in your family that your kids are looking at. What's what's it been like for them? And what's your conversation with your children? Um, first of all, chinuch yeladim, like raising up your kids is never easy. It's never easy. And I feel that the same problems I had are now bigger. For example, if I had a kid who found it hard to get up for shul, then now it's harder for him to get up to, sh to go to shul. But my kids are, my kids are strong and they're getting all the support they need. I have to tell you and I have to tell everybody who hears me now, going, going to someone to help you with, with what is difficult for you, like going on uh, to, to see someone to talk to or a therapist of some sort is, is, is a very good thing. I do it. My kids will do it. I think that if you, I have glasses because I can't see. And now my heart is broken, so I need someone to fix my heart. And I'm doing it. So I just want to say that don't think that it's like a, a gift. I'm at not shamayim. She's so strong, but I'm sitting in my house watching her and I'm not so strong. So what can I do? What can you do? You can do. You can go, you can go build up your emuna. You can go build up your bitachon. You can go see a therapist. You can go start doing physical activity. You can you you have you have a lot to do. You can take responsibility over your life, your physical um, health, your mental health, which is so important. And I try to provide my kids with uh, with as much love and 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 warmth that I can. On the other hand, I can tell you that. People come here with, with presents and people call me all the time. What can I get your kids? What can I get your kids? Can I bring them presents? Can I get them candies? And I, I, I say to, to people, listen, it's enough. It's bad enough that there are orphans. They don't have to be spoiled brats. So the, the, we came, we, we got up from the Shiva. And I told my kids, okay, you, you unload the dishwasher and you load the laundry and you please go and buy me bananas. I am not, I have my limits. I, I have my borders and I have a lot of loving, caring. And if a kid 
feels like he can't go to school today because it's too hard, then okay, don't go to school. I try to, I try to walk between the drops. I don't know if it's a, if it's a between English. Like I try, I do the best I can. It's the first time I, it's the first time I'm handling with such a thing. Sadly, Israel has a lot of knowledge. There are many, many widows and orphans here because of wars and terror attacks. So many smart people and Chacham Kebal Nisayon. Yeah, I wish I, I wish nobody had this Nisayon, but unfortunately there are a lot of people in Israel who, who know from stuff like that. And I get, I get phone calls and visits from women who, 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 who went through exactly what I went through five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And they come here and they, they say, you see, I was, someone came to my kid. My kid is, is, is 11 and it's a person he knows and appreciates very much. And he came up to him and he said, you know, I lost my father when I was nine. And my son said, really? And that was so important for me, for them to see that you can be an orphan and be, uh, um, like build yourself up. And I, I try to do my best. I hope, I pray, I dive into Hashem that now it's his, like, you know, we had there three, three shutafim, right? Three partners in, in a person, right? His mother, his father, and God. And now I have two partners, Bashamaim, and just one partner here. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping the, my partners in Shamaim will help me out with the Chinuch. After Simchus Torah, I, you know, I understand the communication between you and your husband was very limited because of the danger of, of, of war. He had to, you know, focus. Was there, was there like a parting letter or parting message that you gave over to Alicia? Let me tell you a story. The, the day before he was killed, they had some time in the tank. They had some time to speak. Usually you don't have time to speak in the tank because you shoot and you can't hear anything. But they had this break and they had time to speak. And they asked each other, like someone asked my husband, I heard it from the members of his tank who came, who came to the Shiva and they told me. Someone asked my husband, did you leave a parting letter? Did you leave anything? And my husband said, I didn't write anything because I spent so much time, I put in so much time and effort so that every person in my life knows exactly how I feel. So I don't have a letter. I have six kids. I don't, I don't need the letter. I know exactly what Alicia would want us to do. I know he told me numerous times, I don't need the letter. I have, I have him. So this is regarding to what he left me. He left me with so, so much. He left me, he gave me so many letters and presents. We were married 13 years. My husband would try not always succeed, but he would try to give me a present every Rosh Chodesh. So I have so many letters, love letters and notes and for my birthday and our anniversary and on Chagim. I have so many books here that he wrote on to my wife and I know I don't need, I don't need a parting letter. That's, uh, that's one thing. And the other thing I did, I wrote him a letter. I, I wrote him a letter and I know he got it. I can tell you just, I won't tell everything I wrote there, but I could tell you that I did write that the Rambam says, they, in Hilchot Milchama, the Rambam says that, maybe I should say it in Hebrew and then I'll translate. The Rambam says, Me'achar she'ikanes bekishra milchama, yisha'en al mikve Yisrael u'moshiyo be'etzara, ve'yeda she'alichud Hashem u'ose milchama. Imche zecher ishto uvanav. Which means that the Rambam says that when you go on war, you can't, you can't think about your wife and children because that will, that you won't be able to focus. So a person that goes out to war 
has to like not think about that, like erase his his family and just think of Hashem and go fight B'Shem Hashem. And that's, that's what I wrote to him in the letter I sent him. I told him, don't think of us, no personal chashboyness now. It's not personal, it's, it's leumi. And <laughs> do whatever you need to do. And I am very proud of him for doing that. I, I hope I don't sound crazy to you. <laughs> this is probably a hard... You don't, you don't sound crazy. You sound, you sound very strong. It's just... The, I'll tell you the crazy part. Like, I see, and myself included, like, people going through life, everyone has challenges. And, like, someone has a challenge, they're like, oh, no, I was going to the work, and I was late, and they get so frustrated, and they get so upset. And, like, to me, there's so many moments in all our lives. That's human. We get upset about, like, the stupid things. And, like, here you are to to, to be sad and get upset about the the biggest thing but, and but you're so I get upset. you're that's, so strong that's exactly like, i don't think thing. it's crazy i just think no, it's but very that's the thing i get upset from the stupid little stuff i get do you want me to t i'll give you a list of things that drive me crazy i get upset when people park and they don't park between the the things like they park i i hate that oh wow wow i can get the like, lines yeah. yeah i get upset when my kids put put their cards and their stuff inside the, the washing machine and they don't take it out before they throw it in the in the laundry bag. I get upset. I can like I can like scream, scream if someone opens a cereal box and there's already a cereal box opened. Like, gosh, can you not like how can you not see it's a cereal box. It's open. Don't open <laughs> the stupid stuff in life. Of course, I, I get upset about that's 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 human but here it's not that's what i'm trying to say like it's not the same cheshbon it's not the same cheshbon it's like i don't know your 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 situation i don't know if you're married if you have kids if you i have no idea but but it's like when you're when you're in the delivery room and like your firstborn child is now going out to the world and you, you won't tell the nurse, I hate purple. Why did you dress him in purple? Ugh, that's like the, the worst color, purple. Can you get me another color? You're not, it's, it's not what you're dealing with. So it's the same thing. In, in normal everyday life, I'm a normal everyday person. But in a delivery room, I kind of, I, I get like superpowers because this is really a meaningful event. And it's the same, this is a delivery room for the Jewish people. We are, we are reborn here. This is like Yetziat Mitzrayim here, okay? Because finally, finally, after too many years of, of just our enemies killing us and, and we are just like saying, okay, what can we do? Finally, the state of Israel and, and the IDF and in many, in many, in many ways, the world understands that there are bad guys and we should be demolishing them. And this is the nation's delivery room. So I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't care if it's purple. Do you understand? Did you understand my, my? Yeah. No, it's, I think it's very powerful that you're, you're comparing like what's happening now. Um, you know, just you're, it's, it's, it's fascinating. You're taking your personal, I guess, experience out of it and you're looking at it more from like a bigger picture of like, listen, in your situation, it's brutally difficult, I'm sure, but still the big picture of what's going on, this, this is what's meant to be and, and pain comes along with it, but we're, we're going to a good place. Yeah, if you want, I can call my kids and they can say on camera what drives me crazy. And, and the world will see that I'm just a, I'm a normal Jewish mother who, who doesn't, who wants her kids to like eat, eat their vegetables. And I'm a normal person. It's just that this is a not normal situation. I'm a normal person. But in this situation that it's so clear to me that my husband did the right thing and he had his chut. 
to do what Am Israel, the entire Am Israel needs him to do. It's a huge schut. If someone would come up to you and say, listen, Yaakov, you have this like, you can, you can like be, I don't know, you can like be Mordechai Yehudi. Would you tell him today? I can't today. I have, I have, I have to, I don't know, I have something in work. I can't be Mordechai Yehudi today. No, you would say, for sure, I want to be Mordechai Yehudi. Yeah, I want to be remembered in the Jewish history as a person who saved Am Israel. And so this is the, this is the story here. That's really beautiful. The, what's the balance for you with, you know, being appreciative and, and maybe feeling like the luckiest person to have been married to Alicia and raise a family with him for 13 years, but then also, I guess, think of, of life without him and, and the challenges that will come. How do you think of wow. the balance of each side of that? I think that I'm still under denial. That's, that's the honest truth. The minute I think of life without Alicia, I, I just, I, yeah. I start crying. And Shlomo Amelech says, there's a time to cry and there's a time to stop crying. We are at war. We are at war now and, and we need to win. After we win, all the bad guys, the bad guys here in Israel and the bad guys around the world and the bad guys you have in America, after we win, then, then we'll talk again and, and I will tell you how, how I am managing. Uh, the personal aspects are really very hard. They are really, I can't imagine, my, my son, my son's bar mitzvah is like in half a year. I have a baby girl who hasn't yet started speaking. And I'm saying to myself, when she says, Abba, that's it. <laughs> like, that's going to be the day when I'm going to say, Hashem, okay, uh, thank you, but now can you please, like, choose someone else to go through? I just, the, that's it. Like, I can't anymore. And I know that Bezrat Hashem, when I will be in this situation, Hashem will give me koach. Hashem will give me koach. Hanoten layaf koach. We say it every day. We say it every day. I say it every day in davening. Hanoten layaf koach. Hashem, put me through today. Every night I tell Hashem, thank you so much. It was a wonderful day. Please give me strength for one more day. So of course I will break and I will, it will be hard, but I have no choice. The, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people have no choice. Before I get to my last question, I have, um, I have a question. You have and you will have forever all those incredible moments with Alicia, everything you've been through. And it's maybe hard because there's so much to choose from. Could you, could you share a story that, that you're just, I, I don't know, that makes you feel proud, that makes you feel happy about yes. Alicia? My, my husband, he worked in a credit card company. And in this credit card company, Naturally, when you get access to the details of credit cards of millions of people, you have to be a very reliable person. So they did him this credibility test that he had to answer questions, questions such as, uh, have you ever stolen? Have you ever lied? Um, have you ever used something which is not yours? Have you ever... Uh, said something, but it's all, all kinds of questions. And my husband did the test. And then the, the, the person who did the test, who, who, the person who was there, he told him, you didn't pass. You didn't pass the test. And my husband and his boss, they were like, how could Alicia, like the, the angel, the person who never lies, the, the most adin person in the world, how did he not pass credibility test? That's like insane. And my husband's boss went to this person and he told him, listen, you have to explain how your, your test, something went wrong. That's, that's, that, that doesn't make sense. And the person there, he told him, it's too, it's too good to be true. There's no way that a human being 
never stole, never lied, never used a pen, never took uh, a piece of paper from the place he works in to write something personal. That's, that's like, it's too good to be true. And my husband, boss, he told him, no, that's the person. And he worked there for several years and he would make fun of it that they did not believe that it could be. But I told him, I told him, give, give him my phone number, like go to this person who did the test, give him my phone number. I will explain you are a righteous man. You are, my husband never stole or took or, or hurt anybody. He didn't even taste like you have free when you go to the supermarket and you have like olives or whatever and you can taste them. My husband never tasted them. My husband, he would be, he would never take something which is not his. And this is a story I like. I also, I told the story in the, in the sped of my husband, in the eulogy, because I thought this was so, this was so Alicia. Like, this is Alicia. It's really beautiful. Okay, so for the, my, my final question, you know, I've been, I've been noticing, I've been talking to a lot of people in Israel going through extremely challenging times. And I think the world is looking at it like, you know, someone like you, you're going through such a challenging time. How could I give you chizak? How could I give you strength? But the, what's, and that's happening, I'm sure, to some level. But ultimately, I think, more so people like you are giving the rest of the world, you're giving us the strength. What's a message of hope, a message that you want to give to anyone, anyone, maybe someone in America who's very worried about anti-Semitism, maybe it's someone in Israel who's just worried about war, maybe it's, a, it's, it's another uh, you know, fellow person that their, their, their husband or family member is, is fighting now. What would you tell someone who's, who's just feeling worried right now? First of all, feeling worried and feeling afraid are natural feelings. Even Yaakov Avinu, he was afraid before he met Esav. That's, the, the Torah says it. Being afraid, being nervous, that's natural. The thing is, whether it affects you in a way that you cannot, that you cannot work, you cannot be with your kids, you cannot function. And I think that the war is not, we have a war here in Israel and it's a, it's a big war, but the war is going on in America as well. And it's going on inside each and every one of us. There is a, a war between good and evil. That's like the oldest war ever. And we are the good guys and the good guys win. Nekuda, whatever has to be done, like personally, I. Like whatever you have to do in order to keep your mental health and your physical health and your koach and your family, do it. Just like, do it. That's really incredible. Hadas, thank you for taking the time to do this. Hashem should give you and your children the strength. Am Yisrael mm -hmm. is, is with you. And... Um, Alicia will never be forgotten as, as you know, like you said, you know, there's, there's Mordechai in the Torah and forever everyone's going to remember what Alicia did and who he was and, and what kind of, of Yid and how strong he was and he'll be a lesson and someone that we always look up to. Thank you so much.